Hello and welcome to Behind the Music, where we take an inside look at the music you'll hear on North Carolina Symphony programs. I'm Michelle De Russo, Assistant Conductor of the North Carolina Symphony. This weekend, the symphony will perform Cornerstone Works by Tchaikovsky and Sibelius, conducted by Douglas Floyd. The opening piece of this program is Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto in D Major with soloist Chi Yun. Although Tchaikovsky's concerto eventually became a success and one of the most performed compositions, it was initially not well received and it came during a time of deep personal crisis. Written in 1978, Tchaikovsky embarked on this project after hearing Lalo's Symphony Espanol. He admired that Lalo thought more about musical beauty than observing and abiding by established traditions. It is known that Tchaikovsky was not a huge fan of Brahms and Wagner's music and preferred composers such as the Leaves and Bisset. In this spirit, he set out to write an attractive concerto that would please the listeners, and yet the work did not please anyone at the beginning. It was thanks to the public enthusiasm that the piece emerged triumphant in the standard repertoire after being criticized by violinists and critics alike. The piece is set into three standard movements with an opening allegro moderato that starts quietly with a noble tune in the first violins and a brief introduction that anticipates the main theme that after a small crescendo gives way to the soloist presenting the main theme with a simple accompaniment. The pace increases a little with virtuosic movements and approaches the second equally lyrical theme. Although the themes do not contrast, there is variety presented in the interludes and development, including a majestic one with a polonous rhythm and a brilliant coda with virtuoso fireworks. The second movement, Canzonetta, is what the name indicates, a small song. Tchaikovsky had doubts about this movement and wrote a replacement in a day after his patroness, Nadezhna von Meck, criticized it severely. This middle movement presents a plaintive mood and its structure and texture are simple as woodwind chords prepare the soloist setting. There will be two elegant themes quietly introduced with accompaniment from the violins, viola and French horns that lead directly into the final movement without any pause. This movement really shows how Tchaikovsky incorporates Russian elements to his musical language, such as a drone accompaniment the initial theme on the G-string that gives the music a deep, resonant sound, a tempo that gets faster and faster, a lyrical folk melody, and repetitive musical themes. In contrast with the previous movement, the third movement bursts with a fiery orchestral introduction that leads to an unaccompanied entrance from the soloist in a cadenza-like passage and anticipates a dazzling rondeau theme that keeps returning and gives further opportunities for virtuoso display. With tricky scales, double stops, dangerous leaps, and a challenging tempo and accuracy, many of the technical difficulties of the concerto can be found here, but the effect is absolutely stunning. There is no doubt that the concerto is now a standard piece in the romantic violin concerto repertoire, and as Leopold Auer said, the violinist that was intended to play the first performance and cancelled, the concerto has made its way in the world. And after all, that is the most important thing. It is impossible to please everybody. Closing our program, we will perform a contemporary classic that departed from the conventions of its genre, Sibelius Symphony No. 2. Reaching the beginning of the 20th century, Finland was going through some turmoil as they were fired with excitement over their own culture, collecting traditional music and dance, delving into Finnish legends, and returning to use the Finnish language, a clear move against Russian occupation. Sibelius was one of the musicians that produced a series of works during this nationalistic period, the piece Finlandia being the one reaching beyond Finnish borders. But not all of his works were written in Finland, some of his compositions were carried out in Italy. Sibelius traveled to Italy in 1901, where he began composing his second symphony and finished it once back in Finland. It is important to point out that Sibelius' original music is a product of musical genius 
and it is what makes his music profound, specific and evocative, yet timeless and universal, regardless of his nationalistic tendencies. The symphony was the most important genre for Sibelius to develop his musical thoughts at a time when his colleagues like Strauss, Schoenberg, Stravinsky and Bartok were pioneering work done somewhere else than this form. Mahler, a contemporary of Sibelius, took the symphony to mean and be something quite different, while Sibelius tried to continue developing the form in the same direction as Beethoven's symphony. Sibelius composed his second symphony between 1901 and 1902 in four movements with a duration of 45 minutes, making it his longest symphony. The symphony has been associated by some with Finland's struggle for independence and others claim that it had not intended any patriotic message, including Sibelius, declaring that he preferred no programmatic implications to be attached to his work. In this symphony, we get to really see Sibelius' musical structure and architecture, where instead of beginning with melodic statements, he works from the thematic nuclei, which evolve into complete structures. This concept of parts and patterns is illustrated at the beginning of the symphony with a string's gentle riffs of repeated notes seeming to be mere accompaniment waiting for a thing to start above, and that's what it happens. But as the movement progresses, we understand that those figures are actually fragments that would be part of a larger formation. Those opening sounds of the first movement with three rising notes of a scale will come to full fruition in the grandly romantic theme of the finale. The second movement incorporates music that Sibelius first associated with an encounter between Don Juan and death and shows true sustained lyricism. Sibelius begins the movement with a timpani roll and pizzicato strings from which a bassoon melody emerges. The movement ends with a towering brassy theme following a mist-like motif in the divided strings. The scherzo is brief, hurried and expectant followed by a slow section that features a sorrowful lyrical oboe solo accompanied by clarinets and horns. After a trumpet blast, the scherzo is played again with a trio section as the movement transitions into the finale without a pause. From there, the fourth and final movement unfolds slowly, continuously and with increasing power and majesty. It rises and soars in ways that the other movements just don't. Like in Beethoven's Symphony No. 5, Sibelius brings back the transitional material from between the last two movements, but now in a major triumphant key. The conclusion is intended to light up the listener's spirits by giving them confidence in the future ahead of them. Thank you for joining me to learn more about the works you'll hear on this weekend's program. We hope to see you in the concert hall.